At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. The costs of the Iraq war were enormous. More than 4,500 American soldiers, as well as thousands of military contractors, were killed. Tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers were wounded. Hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, and by some estimates, more than a million were killed. And the war created massive instability, including more wars and terrorism throughout the Middle East and North Africa. Fast forward to the 2020 presidential race. There's only one candidate for the nomination of the Democratic Party who played a leading role in actually making the Iraq war happen. In my judgment, President Bush is right to be concerned about Saddam Hussein's relentless pursuit of weapons of mass destruction and the possibility that he may use them or share them with terrorists. Other regimes hostile to the United States and our allies already have or seek to acquire weapons of mass destruction. This was Joe Biden in 2002, speaking as chair of the United States Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. A few months later, when the Senate was debating whether to give President George W. Bush the authority to start a war with Iraq, Biden argues strongly in favor of granting this authority. The objective is to compel Iraq to destroy its illegal weapons of mass destruction and its programs to develop and produce missiles and more of those weapons. Saddam is dangerous. The world would be a better place without him. But the reason he poses a growing danger to the United States and its allies is that he possesses chemical and biological weapons and is seeking nuclear weapons. And unlike uh, my, uh, my colleague from West Virginia and Maryland, I do not believe this is a rush to war. I believe it's a march to peace and security. I believe that failure to overwhelmingly support this resolution is likely to enhance the prospects that war will occur. Joe Biden did so much more than vote for the war. Um, he was the chair of the powerful Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and he really used his control over that committee to make sure that a majority of the U.S. Senate voted to authorize the war. And that, that's a very serious thing. Uh, it's questionable whether the, the authorization to start the war could have even passed Congress without all that Biden did to get it approved. So he really did play a major role um, in bringing us into the Iraq War, a terrible, terrible war. And this was much more responsibility. Um, he, he bears much more responsibility uh, than many other senators who simply voted for it. Of course, the statement about chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons were false. Uh, and many experts already concluded this at the time of the Senate hearings, but Biden didn't allow these experts to testify. That's really significant. Um, as chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, Biden was able to control the Senate debate on the war, and therefore much of the information that most senators received and that major media outlets uh, reported uh, was, was really distorted. There were other Democrats in the Senate who wanted to put limits on Bush's ability to start a war in Iraq. For example, if there was no imminent threat to the United States and the United Nations did not authorize a war, then President Bush would have to come back to Congress for another resolution. But Biden shot this down. So the reason why I oppose the amendment of my friend from Michigan is because the basic premise upon which I began is consistent with where my friend from, from Connecticut begins, and that is that the threat need not be imminent for us to take action. That's authority we're about to delegate to the president. So the fact that he would take such a stridently pro-war position, that he would use that role uh, to uh, limit the debate the way he did, played a major factor in getting the enough defections from the uh, Democratic majority to join with almost unanimous Republican support to make the war resolution pass. As a result, I don't think it would be unfair to say that Biden played a more important role than probably anybody in Congress.
in making the Iraq War possible. The idea that Iraq, uh, which had been rid of its uh, non-conventional weapons and weapons programs and weapons systems that was under the strictest sanctions of any na nation has ever experienced was somehow a threat to the United States and the far side of the world is totally absurd. I mean, totally ridiculous. I mean, the fact that an educated person like Joe Biden with foreign policy experience would believe that uh, it really defies the imagination. But the witnesses mostly reinforced the pro-war arguments question of force really is, should the United States depose Saddam Hussein? And my answer is clearly yes. And my suggestion, as I uh, stated earlier, is that regime change, as the stated U.S. policy, would be the correct uh, way to deal with this problem. In my opinion, weapons inspections are not the answer to the real problem, which is the regime. And the people want a regime change. Let's help them to make this change and liberate Iraq from this oppressor. Iraq has enough to generate the needed bomb-grade uranium for three nuclear weapons by 2005. It is too difficult to see how any measure short of a regime change will be effective. A nuclear arm, Saddam, sometime in this decade is a risk we cannot choose to ignore. It is essential to recognize that the claim made by Saddam's representatives that Iraq has no weapons of mass destruction is false. We know that the Iraq present, permits no one al-Qaeda members to live and move freely about in Iraq. Uh, I am told that that is, uh, uh, that that is the case, that the al-Qaeda groups are welcome uh, and that they're being uh, 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 supported, uh, their families are being supported. I have to tell you, Iraqis desperately want to be freed of Saddam Hussein, and they also know that the only country that can help them with this is the United States. And they are ready to welcome the U.S. as liberators. Has worked Senator Lincoln Chafee of Rhode Island pushed back against the witnesses being stacked, but Biden cut him off. And I do think that uh, it would have been good to have that perspective on this panel uh, that uh, for a better balance. I think we've got uh, from this panel uh, a, a perspective that the threat is very real, very immediate. And I, I, I maybe would ask you to comment on uh, some of these senior military officials, including, according to the article, members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and their Senator Yield, just for a moment, uh, I apologize, but... Uh, Excuse me. Um, the senator uh, from Florida is going to chair the hearing. I have to... Uh, I'll leave for a few minutes, um, and after this panel is over, we'll recess for, uh, um, how much time for lunch? 45 minutes for lunch when this panel, I'm not suggesting we f finish now, but when the panel is finished, we'll recess for 45 minutes. And, uh, and I assure you, uh, Senator, there are other witnesses coming along who think the policy of containment is just fine. So I hope you'll find this is extremely balanced when, you're f when we finish the whole two days of hearings. But uh, I, I thank you for your, uh, let, let me interrupt and I turning that gavel over. Biden never returned to the problem that Senator Chafee raised about the bias of the witnesses that were allowed to testify. I was in the Iraq war twice and in the Afghan war once. You know, for veterans, these wars have had an impact that lasts for our whole lives. Uh, the Iraq war, almost 4,600 American soldiers were killed there. I think as of, uh, as of this, uh, as of the first month of 2020, I think that the total number is 45, 75. Um, the, and that's just the direct number killed because, so, because war has been privatized and contracted out and companies are making money off of it. The estimates are that a similar number, about 4,500 contractors, men and women who were doing jobs in the military that in past wars soldiers would have been doing, were also killed in Iraq. So when you look at the number killed, you have to look at, say, 9,000 rather than almost than 4,500. That does not take into account the suicides. The suicides from these wars, based upon Veterans Administration data, runs between 9,000 and 10,000 killed by suicide. We've also had, uh, uh, you know, tens of thousands of men and women wounded in action. I have Marines in my command who were hit by roadside bombs nine, ten times during a deployment, 
This is why I think so many of us who were in these wars are so disgusted by the political system, so, so upset and furious that people who were responsible for these wars, who, who had a, a, a constitutional responsibility for oversight, just went along with the group thing, just got rid of, of any uh, 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 intellectual honesty or moral honesty. Uh, ISIL is a direct outgrowth of Al Qaeda in Iraq mm -hmm. that grew out of our invasion, which is an example of unintended consequences, which is why we should generally aim before we shoot. We decapitated the government there, left no indigenous leadership, and that not only allowed all sorts of groups within Iraq to revolt against what they saw as an illegitimate occupier, but it attracted jihadist fanatics from around the world. They looked at Iraq and saw, here's the place where we can go kill American soldiers. And they poured in. They're there gaining experience for future wars. So without the sin of the Iraq invasion, we wouldn't be dealing with ISIS today. The first time in my 27 years in intelligence, the first time I have ever heard of a vice president of the United States going out to CIA and sitting down with desk level analysts. It's sitting down and debating with junior level analysts uh, and pushing them to find support for something he personally believes that uh, Saddam was trying to acquire uranium. That to me is pressure and that's intimidation. And they're not going to say, well, Mr. Vice President, you're full of it. So they were manufacturing the case in the bowels of the CIA for Saddam Hussein's possession of weapons of mass destruction. And in the United States Congress. One of the false stories that the Bush administration used to promote the war with Iraq was that Saddam Hussein was actually connected with Al-Qaeda, the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks. Oh, the reason I keep insisting that uh, there was a relationship between Iraq and Saddam and Al-Qaeda because there was a relationship between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was included in the resolution that Biden pushed through the Senate, which gave Bush the authority to go to war. Anybody who had the slightest knowledge about that region would realize the absurdity of the connection between Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda, who actually were bitter enemies. I was in Iraq when Saddam Hussein was in power. Saddam did not tolerate any form of religious extremism. If you were sitting in a cafe and you said to the person next to you, our government really isn't religious enough. We should have more piety from our leaders and in our policies. You'd probably be arrested within an hour. There was no chance of Al Qaeda or any kind of religious extremist group from getting a foothold in Iraq while Saddam Hussein was in power. After Bush invaded, Biden continued to support the war for years. Some of my own party have said that it was a mistake to go to Iraq in the first place and believe that it's not worth the cost, whatever benefit may flow from our engagement in Iraq. But the cost of not acting against Saddam, I think, would have been much greater. And so is the cost, and so will be the cost, of not finishing this job. The President of the United States is a bold leader, and he is popular. The stakes are high, and the need for leadership is great. I wish he'd use some of his stored up popularity to make what I admit is not a very popular case. But I and many others will support him. Nine months ago, I voted with my colleagues to give the President of the United States of America the authority to use force. And I would vote that way again today. It was a right vote then, and it'd be a correct vote today. And President Obama in the Roosevelt Room essentially told me this. September the 10th, 2015. He started off the conversation with these words. There's a bias in this town toward war. I almost fell off my seat. And then he told us for the next 20, 25 minutes that he didn't know what to do about it. There's a bias in this town toward war, said the President of the United States. We have a machine in Washington. It consists of predatory capitalists like Lockheed Martin and ExxonMobil and all they represent. ExxonMobil sells more fossil fuel to DOD than any other entity in the world. 
Lockheed Martin, the biggest weapons merchant in the world, makes a fortune off war. So does Raytheon, Grumman, and Boeing. As long as you have these dollars rolling in, you're going to have constant, endless war. I think in the United States, Biden represents a kind of a long-standing bipartisan uh, commitment to U.S. preeminence on the global stage, in which the U.S. acts as the policeman of the world. I think a lot of Americans are frustrated by this position. They want to have a different kind of relationship to the world, and they want a leader, a president, and a Congress that can present a vision of prosperity for all Americans. I think that only happens when we break with the cycle of endless wars. It is going to be very difficult, I think, for a Democratic Party candidate who basically reiterates the status quo of endless military interventions, endless wars in the Middle East, to win against Donald Trump. At the time of this debate, I was a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I would read the headlines in the paper in the morning, and I'd watch the television newscast, and I'd shake my head. Because you see, just a few hundred feet away from here, in a closed room, carefully guarded, the Intelligence Committee was meeting on a daily basis for top secret briefings about the information we were receiving, and the information we had in the Intelligence Committee was not the same information being given to the American people. I couldn't believe it. Facing clear evidence of peril, we cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. So what happened? We invaded, turned loose, hundreds if not thousands of people scouring Iraq for these weapons of mass destruction, never found one of them. Looked for nuclear weapons, no evidence whatsoever went into our intelligence files and said, okay, Saddam Hussein and Al-Qaeda, let's get this linkage put together once and for all. No evidence at all of a linkage. The American people were deceived into this war. I tell you what, I don't understand how any of these politicians who claim to support the troops and support their families, I don't understand how anyone could hold a mother at the funeral of her son, who just turned 20, who was killed either in the wars or because of suicide, and I've done both, and there's no difference for the mother, and act as if somehow there's some benefit to these wars, when it's demonstrably not. You know, and then you're over there, and you're fighting in it, and you're, you're taking part in it. And, you know, as an officer, I was responsible for my Marines and for my sailors and for... I had their lives, and I was responsible to their families for that. And you do, you think, can I go home and say to the families that it was worth it, that their son was killed, their husband was killed, their brother was killed for something that was good or something that was beneficial. As I said at the outset, if we can sh make the case, which I think, well, I won't say what I think yet, the hearings aren't finished, but if we can make the case that the threat is real and dire, that a free and democratic Iraq, if it could be accomplished, could have a cleansing impact on that part of the world and make our life easier significantly down the road, which I think could be made in an ideal circumstance not even an ideal, and a, if we do things right, um, that it is worth the price.